Hello, and thanks for coming to watch my virtual CHI 2020 talk on understanding and visualizing data iteration in machine learning. To motivate the talk, I want to start with an example. Assume you're building some sort of machine learning model, and you're working with some convolutional neural network. You've imported your, uh, your data, you're able to do the data transformation and prepare it in a way that makes sense, you get your modeling code up and running, you train it, and you're presented with an accuracy of about 81% on your test data set. And that doesn't quite meet your bar in order to deploy this model, so you want to boost it up a little bit. Well, that's one natural question. How are we going to improve this model's performance? There's a couple of different things we could do. For example, we could try a different architecture. Maybe this convolutional neural network model needs some more layers, less layers, or it's too complicated and we just need a simpler model in general. Another thing we could do is try to tweak some of the hyperparameters of the, uh, the training process, or maybe some hyperparameters of the, the model architecture itself. We could also try to adjust the loss function, maybe either adding or removing some term and seeing how that affects the, the test accuracy. Or maybe we really need to reconsider this problem, go to our statistics textbooks and, and understand a little bit more about what this data really is. But all these things sound much too hard and I'm, I'm too lazy to really bother to do any one of them. I wish there was just an easier way to boost this accuracy without having to do these complicated options. And so I want to propose an alternative, which is don't worry about those things I just mentioned. Just simply add more data to your data set and see what happens to your test accuracy. Now, when you do this, you'll actually see that you can boost your accuracy quite a bit. On the left hand side, I have this example taken from the Keras uh, GitHub uh, project. Uh, I've, just, I've just run the, the code as is, but I've reduced the number of data a little bit. So on the left hand side, we have 6,000 data points. And on the right hand side, we have 60,000 data points. So there's a 10 times increase. And you see by not changing anything else besides the amount of data, we can get our test accuracy all the way to 99%. This sounds silly, but it actually works. You can go and run this example yourself uh, just as is. You don't need to do any other modifications to the code. And this has actually resonated with the machine learning community. Here's a fake archive paper that, that I thought is, is pretty funny uh, that's titled Surpassing the State of the Art on ImageNet by Collecting More Labels. And a couple of things in this abstract that I find particularly funny um, or, or maybe even more relevant is that they're able to clean and grow the training data set. It's the primary way that they achieve this, this fake you know, 100% performance. And they just repeat this process until the accuracy is approved enough. And something about this repeating and iteration process is really interesting because this actually happens in practice. And this repetitive process is called a data iteration. So what is it exactly a data iteration? Well, let's look at the high level view of machine learning. So given the world, we collect and sample data sets from some sort of phenomena that exists. From those data sets, we then construct machine learning models. Now the data visualization and HCI community has done a great job uh, producing uh, uh, tools to help people do model iteration. These are things like tweaking hyperparameters and seeing the outputs of different types of models and selecting the best model you want to, to use. But there's this whole other part of machine learning as well, namely data iteration, where instead of changing the modeling code, we're actually changing the data set. We're adding features, removing features, we're removing points, or maybe adding more points um, from, from the world. And there's really a lack of tooling around this area, which leads us to our CHI paper this year about understanding and visualizing data iteration in this machine learning process. So in the paper, we have a couple of different contributions. This first one is that we're able to identify common data iterations and challenges through practitioner interviews with machine learning researchers, designers, developers, and managers at Apple. And then from all those findings, we're able to design and develop a collection of interactive visualizations to support various tasks within data iteration. And we build all these into a tool that we call Chameleon. With Chameleon, we then show and present two case studies revealing interesting things about someone's data iteration process on two real data sets and machine learning projects at Apple. For the rest of this talk, let's go through these contributions one by one. Let's start with some of these practitioner interviews that we did at Apple. So with 23 different practitioners across 13 teams, we were able to understand their specific needs and challenges around data iteration in their own work. And one thing that really stood out is that this notion of doing data iteration to improve performance. Here's one of my favorite quotes from all these interviews. It says, most of the time, we improve performance more by adding additional data or cleaning data rather than changing the model's code. So besides improving model performance, why else do people want to do data iteration? Well, data bootstraps modeling. For example, at the beginning of a machine learning project, you may not have all your training data set yet. 
but you still need to get started to learn something about your domain. So as you start with a small data set and more data comes in, you're inherently doing a data iteration, namely an add iteration on your training set. And the world changes. And as the world changes, the data that we collect is gonna change with it. When it comes to data iteration frequency, we saw that developers said that their models can change on the order from either months or all the way down to daily, but data can actually change on the order from months all the way to per minute. So every minute you could be getting new points to add to your training data set that could either be in or out of your normal distributions. And one, uh, one other challenge that they uh, mentioned is this notion of entangled iterations. So we've shown that there can be both model and data iterations. But what's interesting is that you need to make sure to you have to separate them in order to have fair comparison. If you change your data and your modeling code at the same time and you get an accuracy increase, you may not know which to attribute it to. So you need to have this clear separation between either changing your data and retraining a model or changing your model's parameters, keeping your data fixed and then retraining a model. When it comes to the com common types of data iterations, most developers added something to their data set, but there was other cases of removing or modifying things as well. When it comes to addition, we see that there's, uh, there's iterations for just adding more uh, data instances from you know, some sampled population sort of randomly, adding specific instances in the case of something like class imbalance, adding synthetic instances, so this could be either augmenting an existing data set with rotation or translation, uh, translation of different uh, types of data, adding different labels in a supervised machine learning case, but then also removing instances that are either noisy or uh, uh, have errors in them or are outliers, and then also modifying different features or labels as well. These include things like cleaning or editing and fixing one's data. And then lastly, some of the challenges that came up time and time again is that developers aren't able to track their experimental and iteration history. And because data is changing all the time, it's not quite clear when to unfreeze a data version to include more data or when it's time to stop collecting uh, and call it a day. One other thing that they happened uh, uh, to, to face a lot is, is doing a lot of manual failure case analysis, finding different data points that weren't working correctly, and then having to go back and track them all themselves. And then once they find outlier points, they build these data blacklists that they don't want to include in their model. But this all has to be doing manually and, and uh, defining different filters to, to filter out these points. So all those challenges led us to build this tool that we call Chameleon. And Chameleon has a number of interesting features. So we're able to retroactively track and explore data iterations and model metrics over different data versions. And then we're able to attribute model metric changes to different data iterations that have been taken. And then one other uh, interesting thing about some of the views within Chameleon is that we're able to understand models sensitivity uh, over different data iterations. So just by simply adding or removing data points, your model is going to behave in different ways. So we can find those data points that go back and forth and change predictions to find out how sensitive different regions of one's data set is. And in the tool Chameleon, every single feature gets one of these, uh, what we call an overlaid diverging histogram. So for every feature, we're able to encode a lot of information in one single chart. So you can compare feature distributions by their training and testing splits. You can do it by performance, either correct or incorrect, incorrect predictions. This is above or below the axis. And then also by data versions, which we use as color. So this pink and blue. And then where they overlap is where you had some shared data across two different data um, iterations. So we have some other visualizations in the tool as well that I briefly want to mention. We have this aggregated embedding view, which is a dimensionality reduction of all of our, our data points at a particular data iteration. We also have a prediction change matrix. So here we list two different data iterations and it shows <clears throat> which data points were correct in both versions, incorrect in both versions, or the ones that had a bit more interesting, uh, this, these off diagonals where you had some points that flipped their prediction over different data iterations. But besides just two data iterations, we can actually look at the sensitivity of all data points <clears throat> over every single data iteration, which we show in the sensitivity histogram on the right. So here's just a quick demo of some of the other features of our tool. At the very top, you'll see we have this timeline of data iteration versions. And as we click on different things like 1.13, data version 1.10, or even 1.8, you see all the different views in the tool update to reflect what your data looked like at that particular version. All these views are linked as well. So say if we click a particular cell in the aggregated embedding view, that updates which data is shown in the features on the right-hand side. 
Here, this gives us pretty really quick access to filter down our data space in order to compare these subsets within the aggregated embedding view to the global distributions uh, of your entire data set. The prediction change matrix allows us to find the points that flip predictions over data iterations. This is equivalent to splitting these, dis, uh, these histograms to show either the pink or blue directly above or below. And then the sensitivity histogram allows us to find data points whose predictions are changing quite a bit, which tells us that these points may be outliers, really hard to learn, and maybe you should think about adding more data within their particular feature range. So to sum up, I wanna present just these two case studies quickly uh, and some of the findings uh, and learnings we had by showing Chameleon working on, on real data sets collected in the wild. So for this first case study, it's on a sensor prediction task, which has about 64,000 instances collected over two months, and each data point has about 20 features. Now, one thing that was really interesting when the developers of this project used our tool on their own data was that visualization was able to challenge their prior data collection beliefs. So for example, in the chart below, we see that this feature is relatively steep uh, and long-tailed, and there's a slight bimodal distribution going on here too. Now the developers knew that their data was bimodal, but they didn't know how steep this first um, uh, uh, part of the, the graph was. So there's much more points on the left-hand side around the value of zero than there are um, in the, the second smaller hump that comes up uh, later, uh, uh, further down the feature range. So this was something that visualization was able to show them immediately, but not only that, over data iterations, as we move from left to right, we see that this features distribution really solidifies over time and the shape doesn't move a whole lot. Now this helped them you know, understand both that uh, the, the data feature shape is, is a bit more drastic than they thought originally, but they were also um, sort of relieved to know that the distribution wasn't changing greatly over time and that it really solidifies to a particular bimodal shape. In a second case study, um, we have about 48,000 instances uh, from a user's logs uh, collect over six months, uh, and each data point has about 34 features. And one thing, if we get down to this instance level analysis that Chameleon really promotes and encourages, is that the developers here were really interested in the aggregate embedding view. There was a lot of smaller clusters. And when they would click on one of the points, it would of course filter the different views. And this helped them inspect the performance across features uh, which was something that was really important to them uh, to, because they, they had a, a very um, strong understanding of what their domain and data set was, uh, but they didn't always know how it fit into the, the global distributions. One thing that was also really interesting in, in this case study is that halfway through um, their modeling process, they actually changed the modeling code at one point in between two data iterations, and that was immediately captured in our tool. So in between two particular data iterations, there was a steep drop-off in the accuracy because of that modeling code changed, and they were able to use Chameleon to inspect that a bit more detailedly with, the, with a data-first focus. So to sum up, I want to just list a few opportunities for future uh, machine learning iteration tools. So we've shown that there's existing work on model iteration, and this is one of the first works really promoting data iteration. But these two things go hand in hand in practice. So there needs to be interfaces that can handle both data and model iterations jointly. We also think that data iteration tooling can help experimental handoff. So by that, I mean, if a new team member joins a machine learning team or leaves, they can use Chameleon or some other tool to actually go back and have this nice, rich interactive history of what's already been tried in the project. We also think data can be a shared connection across user experience. If you have your own data and you know it well, you still maybe want to use machine learning. So if we can actually promote data as the primary object to be modifying, changing, and adding to to boost performance, uh, it can actually uh, incorporate a lot more people in the machine learning process besides just these expert machine learning users. Another interesting area for future work is visualizing probabilistic labels from different techniques like data programming where if you add new data points or you add a labeling function, you get new labels and you want a way to visualize and track those labels updating over time. And tools like Chameleon could be really well adapted to this problem. And then lastly, one limitation of this work is that we are doing it primarily on uh, numeric um, and tabular data, but there can be a lot of opportunity to extend these, these histograms, these feature histograms to other types of data like images or, or even text data. And with that, I want to thank you all for, for watching this talk. In the bottom right here, I've put a URL. If you go there, you'll find all the materials of the paper, the PDF, some other video demos, uh, and recording of this talk as well. 
So thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take questions and you can find my email at the, the link below.